Good day and welcome to the Government Information Services panel discussion on two very important bills which will be discussed in the House of Assembly on October 30, 2018. Now the two bills are the Child Justice Bill and the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill. And to discuss this we have three guests in studio. We have Ms. Mrs. Elizabeth Lewis, Director of the Family, sorry Mrs. Elizabeth Lewis, Director of Social Services, Beverly Ann Poyot, Director of Family Court, and Yolanda Jules Louis, Director of Probation and Parole. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. So let us start with the purpose of these two bills and a little bit on its background. Can you speak on that? Well, yeah. Um, this morning we are here to discuss the two bills, as you indicated, and St. Lucia takes a step closer to improving our legal landscape. Um, with respect to how we engage and deal with children and families. And so you will hear a little more, a lot more, in fact, about what is referred to as the Child Justice Bill, which speaks mainly to children who come in conflict with the law, and the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill, which speaks to how we deal with children who are um, victims of abuse and who need support from, from the state. Okay, uh, for now I just want to speak briefly on the, the Child Justice Bill. The, the bill mentions the age of criminal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Could any of you explain what that is? Okay. Age of criminal responsibility in St. Lucia currently is 12 years old. It is the minimum age at which a child can be held responsible for committing infringing penal law in St. Lucia. In other words, a child at age 12 can be arrested and charged for committing an offense. Mm -hmm. After the bill is passed, the age will be 12? Or is it currently 12? It is currently 12, and it will be 12 after the bill is passed. It will remain 12. So what are the sort of implications that you foresee with the, the passing of this bill, or with the, the age of criminal responsibility being 12? The age of criminal responsibility, what really it does is to allow, <clears throat> allow us within the juvenile justice system to really look at whether that child has an understanding of what it is that they did. And that is what the age of criminal, criminal responsibility really speaks to. As we know, all children go through their development in a progressive manner, but some quicker than others. And so that will allow us um, to be able to determine whether that child understands what it is they have done and whether they can, they can actually be held responsible for the action which they have committed. An action, as we are speaking, something that would be against you know, the laws of the state. And there has, has there been uh, any sort of psychological research to determine that, that at that particular age, uh, a minor would f understand their responsibility? Yes, there are studies that have been done, and if we just look at the general um, child, the way, the manner in which a child develops, general developmental stages of children, mm -hmm. it has been determined that that is a reasonable age at which a child should have a basic understanding of right from wrong, um, good from bad, things that a child is normally taught, you know, from a very early age. And what sort of, does St. Lucia have any secure facilities that can house children who have committed offenses at that age? Yes, we currently have the Boys Training Center, as everybody knows. Mm -hmm. That is our detention center for boys um, who have come into conflict with the law. For us in St. Lucia, it's the only institution that we have. Um, and Boys Training Center also houses our children, some of our children who are in need of care and protection. The facility has been separated in two mm -hmm. so that they are not... Um, completely together so you have that facility it is our hope that we will get a facility for girls currently we don't have a secure for residential facility for girls however having said that we when we look at the child justice bill one of the things that it speaks to is diversion and i guess we will discuss that a little bit more so diversion really 
is going to allow us to be able to assist children, to be able to put programs in place where children don't necessarily have to be housed, don't have to be in detention centers in order for any kind of rehabilitation to take place. So what, what exactly does diversion mean? If they're, if they're not housed in the detention centers, does so that mm -hmm. mean they will be taken care of in another facility or in a, a sort of transit home or, a, or at their own homes by their parents? Okay, basically, diversion is going to speak to a procedure that the courts will use for children in conflict with the law to send them to programs that will help <coughs> with their rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So these programs may, de may be day programs, hence they will not stay in any residential facility for that matter. Mm. Just to add a bit, um, and let me just take us back a bit in terms of a brief um, background and history. Um, one of the things we've recognized, or it was recognized back then, that's St. Lucia and other OECS countries signed on to a number of conventions and treaties. And of course, we have to live up to certain standards if you are going to sign on to them. So these bills actually came out of, these two bills that we are discussing this morning, they are coming out of another group of five or other bills um, that were put on the table as areas that we needed to improve on um, as we deal and with children and families. Um, so there's going to be a lot of changes. Now I heard you ask um, about the issue of the age. Mm. Um, age becomes a big issue, not just in respect of the criminal responsibility, but age is going to become an issue in respect of the changes of who is a child. So this, in those bills, a child um, will be considered somebody under the age of 18. Now that is a major shift for us. That is going to be a major shift for us. Because as it stands now, for us at the family court and at the probation and at human services, a child is considered somebody under the age of 16. Mm -hmm. So with the passage of those two bills in particular, we will see age of a child now changing. And so we are going to have a wider spread, a wider net um, by which we can provide support for, for children. And so um, the whole issue of diversion is for us to ensure that we provide enough services and support to young people, that we don't just take them and place them in institutions, mm -hmm. um, that when we pick them up on offenses, minor, minor offenses in particular, then we can provide them with a way out that they don't necessarily have to get themselves um, within the juvenile system, the justice system, and of course be labeled as criminals as you know we do. And so um, the whole idea of the bills is to now ensure that our young people, our children, our families are given greater support within the justice system. In terms of, as you mentioned, that the, the punishable age is, is, well, children are considered children under 16. What does that mean in terms of punishment of a minor who has committed a crime? Is, are, will they be held to the same standards as an adult committing a crime? Um, like anything else, uh, if a, a young person commits a crime, we will, under this child justice bill, there will be a particular way of dealing with and managing with this child. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that children will not be punished, as we say. You know, we always want mm -hmm. to know that people get punished for doing something mm -hmm. wrong. But certainly, we are going to look at several other issues surrounding the child as to why the child got themselves involved with such, you know, in such mm -hmm. a behavior. And so it is not just going to be, you have stolen from X, and so now we are taking you to court, and now you are sending you to, to bodily, or, you mm -hmm. know, or to BTC, to Boys Training Center, or somewhere. But now we are going to look at your history. We are going to look at your background. We're going to try and understand what made you do this. And of course, once it is deemed that this child, there is hope, you know, that we can work with this child, then we are going to provide services for this child under the whole idea of diversion. Diversion is a major aspect, as you would have heard from Ms. Um, Poyot and Mrs. Mrs. Louis, mm -hmm. under the Child Justice Bill, because it really now is going to cause us as practitioners to work much closer with other entities within the society, <coughs> because it doesn't mean that we say diversion, that diversion has to be done at the family court or um, at probation and parole or at human services. Now we have to engage the entire society to see how we can all now wrap ourselves around this particular child or group of children to ensure that their lives improve um, and so they don't remain out there um, and they end up, you know, as 
criminals, as we want to make call mm -hmm. them. So what would be the role of the police officer in terms of apprehension or detention of a minor offender? Hmm. Uh, let me let Mrs. <laughs> Louis, because this is really the role okay. of probation. Mm -hmm. um, actually, under the child justice bill, the police are the first responders to apprehending a child. Once the police apprehends the child, they need to inform the probation department mm -hmm. so that this word is this word that a child has been apprehended mm -hmm. is actually communicated to a probation officer mm -hmm. who will then, in all respects, <coughs> begin to handle the matter from then. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the police actually are the ones who are going to apprehend and they have to communicate to probation. And what is the process when it within goes Within a specific time period. Mm -hmm. What is the process when it goes to the per, um, probation okay. officer? Child's matter or case is reported to probation mm -hmm. or to probation officer. The probation officer will engage with respect to carrying out assessments, risk assessment, mental health screening tools, getting parents and all significant others involved, mm -hmm. and the child, after all these assessments and reports are going to be submitted to the magistrate who will be sitting along with two other social workers on what is called an inquiry. Uh, what, okay. what happens in the event that a police officer is, is unsure of the minor's age? Okay. This is verified having hold of a birth certificate for mm -hmm. the child. That's one of the first things that has to be done. Mm -hmm. The age of the child, um, you spoke of uncertainty of the age of the child, in as much as the police officer who makes the apprehension reports to probation, the child's parent or guardian also has to be called in. So in that manner, all of the biographical details and all of that would be part of the preliminary assessments that Mrs. Lee was speaking about, together with the mental health screening and all of these kinds of things. Mrs. Louis also made mention of the initial inquiry. It is at the initial inquiry that our first level of diversion can come in. Because at that inquiry, we would already have a background of the child. And it's very important for us to note here, mm -hmm. that is one of the major differences that we are going to have in our system. Generally, when a child is apprehended now and brought to court, we know very little about the child. Mm -hmm. It is only right before sentencing that the probation officer is required to do a pre-sentence report. With this new system coming into place, we're going to have information about the child prior to going to court. So we already know who it is we're dealing with. And it's important because we are now looking at dealing with children who come into, the con who come into conflict with the law in a very individualized way. Um, process. It is no longer one size fits all. And so knowing about the child going into the initial inquiry, whether the child takes, the re takes responsibility for their actions, all of these are going to determine whether diversion can happen at that point in time. And that is what we call pre-trial diversion. Uh, what are the sort of the rights that a child would, or a minor would have during, while, while being detained in police custody? rights of the child. The child has the right to um, have an attorney. That again is another major shift in the, in the manner in which we deal with children. Mm -hmm. So attorneys will be made um, available for children who, who require it. The child also has the right to have their parents and guardians present. The child has a right to speak. Okay, and to say whether they understand or don't understand something. So these are just some of the basic things that the child is going to be part of the process and not the process happening around the child. Is there any circumstance where a minor could be sent to a place like bodily correctional facility? Um, based on our current system, because we do not have any additional facilities, there is a unit at bodily that has been designated for age 16 to 18 and in the absence of any other institution that area at bodily can still be used to house our children age 16 to 18 but as i said it is away from the general population and it is designated specifically for that category with the passage of the new legislation 
all of the processes and procedures will also be extended to them because they do fall into that category as children now. Okay, we are actually due for our first break right now. So this is the Government Information Services panel discussion on the Child Justice Bill and the Adoption Bill. We'll be back in a moment. I'm so fed up with my 14-year-old child. She's driving me crazy. I just don't know what to do. All that child need is some good licks to wake up. Alice, ignore the counseling pants is given. Government employees have free access to professional counseling services under the Employee Assistance Program, known as EAP. EAP? EAP? What's that? Uh, not me that telling people my business. Listen to me, Alice. I was struggling with my child. I made an appointment to see an EAP counselor, and I was very satisfied with the service that I received. And you know what? Up to a day like today, my information remains confidential. Cox, how come nobody in the office knew anything about your counseling? Ah, that's because EAP counselors, they work on the strict clauses of confidentiality. I know you know what confidential means. Eh, uh -uh. EAP providing professional counseling services? How much is it? Girl, the counseling is free. Free for you, free for your child. And you know what? Your information remains confidential. Call the EAP unit at the Ministry of the Public Service. Telephone number 468-2269 for more information. EAP works. Let it work for you. Welcome back. So before the break, we were speaking about the bodily detention facility. Uh, could you speak on what circumstances would lead to a child being sent to the site facility, how specifically for minors? Um, the main reason would be because of age. Mm -hmm. um, and the second, main, the second reason would probably be because of the nature of the offense. Uh, offenses uh, come on, a different, on different levels, and based on the level of offense, mm -hmm. the law speaks to what can and cannot be done at a particular level. Say, for example, if a child is accused of committing murder, that would be one of the instances where the child would be mm -hmm. sent to the secure facility at Baudelaire. And uh, could you speak on when the Division of Human Services actually becomes involved in criminal matters regarding juvenile offenders? Right. So um, the Division of Human Services really does not that. that when it comes to children engaging in um, offenses, that these are children who would be dealt with through probation and parole under the Child Justice Bill. Division of Human Services, however, comes in when we break, talk about the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill. Currently, we have one act, that is the Children and Young Persons Act, that would guide us, provide guidance to us and the court for both dealing with juveniles and children who require care and protection. And so with the separation now, which we are going to see with the passage of those two, with those two bills, Human Services now becomes the agency will have legal responsibility to ensure protection and providing support to children and families to improve their social situation. Um, and so this is where, where we'll fit in. Um, when this bill, the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill is passed, Human Services will be named in this bill as having that legal responsibility, as I mentioned earlier. And so um, one of the things that is going to be different for us, apart from now having a wider span of children to deal with, now we are moving from just focusing on children under 16, mm -hmm. now to focusing on children under 18, um, is that we will also have the responsibility for adoption. Currently, adoption is being done at the AG's office, the Attorney General's office, mm -hmm. they are responsible. But this new bill is um, going to move forward in that there's going to be an adoption committee um, working very closely with human services for adoption because we recognize that adoption is still a child protection issue mm -hmm. and it's not just facing a child if anybody anyhow, anywhere, any, um, anywhere, sorry. Um, so it is, it's going to change how we do things at human services really and truly. 
we are going to see a difference in the number of the type and number of orders that the court can provide to ensure protection of children. We are going to see changes in um, how we do our own processing at human services. Um, there are going to be uh, issues on, on time limits for investigations. That is going to go, be very critical as we go forward in ensuring that we respond in a timely fashion um, to issues of children, you know, anything that comes in um, for needing child protection. And of course, another major one for us is going to be the issue of supervision. Um, so, whereas a child may commit ex um, presenting challenging behaviors, uh, currently, um, probation and parole would engage them. It would have it now. It would now become the responsibility of human services, and we would have the option if, after working with the family, um, that we are not seeing that kind of synergy, that kind of work with the family and the children, mm -hmm. then we can go before the court and ask for a supervision order to ensure that things happen in the manner as was planned with the hope that it's going to improve the child's situation. Okay. I want to get to the, uh, the adoption bill in a second, but uh, before I move on to that, I want to, to explain the, the issue of confidentiality with regard to the child justice bill uh, and its, uh, its importance regarding the identity of alleged child offenders. Could, you, could any of you speak on that? Mm -hmm. Um, like anything else, um, I'll start off and let Mrs. Ms. Louis take on. Um, confidentiality is always very important when you're dealing with children and families. I mean, for us, even on the adoption, I mean, there's a penalty. There's going to be a penalty for anybody who gives out any information regarding um, adoption. And likewise with, with, um, with, with young people, um, that when they come in contact with the law, what we certainly do not want is for the information to be out there in the public. Um, we have to respect that notwithstanding that they are children, they have rights too. And one of those rights is to ensure some level of protection and, and support for them. And this is where the whole issue of confidentiality is coming, how we are going to engage and process them. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be very, very critical in their own um, development and how they turn out under the system. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Mrs. Louis wants to add a little more. Um, yes, just basically to state in the initial inquiry process mm -hmm. to maintain confidentiality, it will only be persons who are important to the process. Mm -hmm of what is happening to the child. For example, significant others, no other person will be allowed in the initial inquiry process. Okay. I want to stretch that a little further and speak to the whole issue of a record, a police record, as far as a child is concerned. When mm -hmm. we speak of confidentiality, when we look at um, persons who come into conflict with the law, we know that there's a police record that follows them. With our children, there's going to be no record that follows them. Uh -huh. So if anything happens before the age of 18, yes, it is logged, it is catalogued, it is kept in confidence. But af after the age of 18, there is no criminal record that carries over with that child. So in the event that, um, I'm thinking of a scenario, a scenario here where a, a minor offender gets to the age of maybe 20, 21, and they're looking for a, they're applying for a job or a scholarship or something of that nature. They, their criminal past, their criminal record from the, under the age of 18, it will not, they will not have to disclose that, it will not affect them in any way? It should not dis affect them unless, let me just clarify, unless it is one of the level three offenses, which are the higher category mm -hmm. of offenses. And but. Mm -hmm. Such ahead. as, as I said, uh, men mentioned earlier, for murder and things like mm -hmm. manslaughter. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about things like stealing, petty mm -hmm. theft, mm -hmm. and so on, that is not going to be on record. Okay. okay, the other thing I can share on that is this child, having attained the age past 18, mm -hmm. can now apply for their records to be expunged. Mm. Okay? Okay. Now I want to speak about the, the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill. Uh, with the child care bill, will this give children more of a say in their own welfare? Mm -hmm. And what, what exactly does it mean that they will have more of a say with, um, with regards to their own welfare? Um, currently, and I, I, I will speak from a wider societal issue, that we seem to think that children should not have a mm -hmm. say in things that concern them. 
Mm. Part of what this bill is going to do is that when we sit to discuss plans on behalf of a child, once a child is of an age to understand, then the child is allowed to make an input. Um, because if, let us face it, if you are going to make a decision on my behalf, shouldn't I be part of that decision making to say what I would like, what I would not like? I mean, it doesn't mean that we will always take what they say into consideration, I mean, to do what they say. But of course, we, this bill is going to allow for a, a, a wider discussion to take place, to allow children to be able to present their side of the, of the story. Um, and not just us as adults sitting and making decisions about them. Mm -hmm. I must say, though, um, currently what happens um, when a matter is taken into court, the magistrate at the family court does sometimes allow the child to come in and, and present the issue. So it's not going to be very different. Um, it's just that it's now going to be in a, in a bill. Um, because sometimes you need to hear from the children what really happened and what would they like, especially when it relates to placement of children. Um, if you are going to remove a child from their home for whatever reason or the other and you're looking to place them somewhere else, um, they may be able to guide you in terms of where best you know, they can be placed or who is the best person to have them. And that, um, that is also taken into consideration in adoption situations where the ch when children are of a certain age, you can ask them. I mean, Jacques wants to adopt you, how do you feel about mm -hmm. it? And so this is, this is the whole idea behind that. Now you mentioned the child being removed from their environment or their home. What sort of circumstances would lead to that? Well, as happens now and as will continue to happen when this bill is, is, is passed, is that um, when a report of child abuse is made to the Division of Human Services, so we now have to investigate the matter and to determine, to move in immediately into determining the safety of the child. And so if it is deemed that the, the, the issue is within the home um, and the child needs to be protected almost immediately, then what we do is to make an application to the courts to have the child placed in another, uh, another setting. Um, always and always we look at family first. So we may look for an aunt, an uncle, somebody who is directly related to the child or somebody who has stood up for the child in the past. And so this is something that we are currently doing and is going to continue with, with this new bill. Now, I also, you mentioned that the, obviously earlier on that the child would have more of a say. How do you ensure that the child understands what is going on? Are there provisions in place to ensure that the child, let's say a five-year-old, if he's being removed from his home or his environment, mm -hmm. how do you ensure that that five-year-old understands exactly what's happening? Um, well, for a lot of us who deal with children, we know at different ages there's, there's a language that you can use. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we are going to have our clinical psychologists, our counselors, persons who understand where the children are at, and we'll be able to explain to them in their language mm -hmm. um, what is happening. And it is very important, and that is certainly there in this new bill, that we explain to the children in their language and at the age and stage of development what the process is going to be. Uh, the bill, just to expand on what Mrs. Lewis was saying, the bill also makes provision that human services can place a child with a prospective adoptive parent even prior to the adoption. And mm -hmm. this kind of situation would allow for the kind of synergies we want to see, to see whether the parent and the child is a good fit, to see whether everything is working properly. So having the ability to do that, having the law state that it can be done is also very important. Along with that, there's also the whole issue of foster care. Foster care is a system that we have had in St. Lucia for many, many years, but it has never been legislated. Mm -hmm. This bill is actually going to legislate foster care and allow the Division of Human Services to take even more stringent measures in terms of who can become foster parents, what are the responsibilities of the foster parents, what are the responsibilities of the division to the foster parent, and in addition to which, what are the responsibilities of the child who is now going into foster care. Because in as much as a child is placed in foster care for, say, some sort of abuse, that child also has some sort of responsibility um, in that new environment that they are being placed, and the responsibility obviously is for their own safety. Okay, we are actually due for our second break. This is the Government Information Services panel discussion on the Child Adoption Bill and the Child Justice Bill. We'll be back in a moment. Pamela, 
I noticed that you built your retaining wall on my property. You will have to give me my land back or compensate me for that. My contractor isn't dumb. I trust that he will not build anything on your property. Where is your proof? Let's go to court. This situation does not require you to go to court. Looks like we have to go through mediation here. Mediation is a way people resolve conflicts like this. Someone, a third party, comes to speak to both parties. This person is called the mediator. The mediator is impartial. He or she makes sure that communication between both parties is effective and efficient. So, the mediator is a judge? No, the mediator is not a judge. Mediators, unlike judges, do not decide cases or impose settlements. Let me get a mediator to handle this retaining wall and that kitchen. Kitchen? Yes, your kitchen also falls on my land. Let me call the mediator. Welcome back to the Government Information Services panel discussion on the Child Care Protection and Adoption Bill, Bill and the Child Justice Bill. Uh, so earlier you were talking about foster care. Could you speak a little bit about the, the role of a foster parent? What is a foster parent? A foster parent is somebody who puts themselves forward, um, wanting to assist a child who's in need. A child, say for example, who has been abused or neglected. And so the foster parent now becomes the legal guardian of that child, taking full responsibility for the child. As I indicated earlier, um, the Division of Human Services has that program in place, but now the law is going to speak to it and is making it something that is legitimate, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. So let us say that I have knowledge of a child that is not being adequately taken care of or abused in their home. What, is, what do I do? What is the process that I, that I have to initiate to ensure that that child is removed from that environment? If I'm a neighbor and I notice something's going on, what happens okay. then? I'll start and then I'll let Mrs. Liz <laughs> continue with that one. Um, if you are aware, your first responsibility is to report it. And you can report that abuse to either the police or you can report it to the Division of Human Services as well. Okay, so that is the first responsibility you report, what it is you see, how often you see it, what is happening, um, and what are your perceptions of what is happening. And once you do that, of course, you now are going to do that um, you, without any fear of your name being mentioned or anything. So again, mm -hmm. it's a confidential process. Mm -hmm. So once human services get, the, get that report, then they start with whatever processes, with their processes to, of investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to add to that, um, what's one of the things that I'm going back to the bill, one of the things that we are now seeing is a, bit, is a whole issue of persons who are mandated to report. Mm -hmm. So we have the issue of mandatory reporters and persons, I'm speaking of persons like teachers, persons who work with children, doctors, nurses, um, counselors, school counselors. They will are mandated reporters and that is actually in the bill. But apart from that, I mean, anybody who sees a child um, being abused or neglected should be concerned. And your concern should lead you to reaching out to some agency or somebody who can provide support to that child. Hence the reason, and we always ask people to make that call um, to the police or to the Division of Human Services. And I mean, as Ms. Port indicated, we commence the process of investigation to determine the issues of safety um, and protection of this child. And of course, move it through there. The child needs to be removed, the child needs to remain in the family. If it's a situation where you just work with the family and the child, um, that will be determined after we have assessed the whole situation. Now, Mrs. Lewis, this other question is for you as well. Uh, when is the decision made by the Director of Human Services that an investigation should be launched into the welfare of the child? Once a report is made. Once, just once yeah. a once report, a is, report made. is made, that starts off the, the ball, that starts the ball rolling. Is there anything specific so, you can mention in terms of a, a red flag? Um, well, a report is made and I would imagine some, if somebody makes a report, they would say to you, I'm aware of this child and this is the situation. And once a report is made, it will become, it is our responsibility, but even more so when the bill is passed, to launch an investigation immediately to determine the safety of this child. And what happens if a report is made falsely? 
or well through a malicious intent. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting because we had just had some major discussion on that some time ago. Um, because as it stands, before I do answer your question, we have lots of persons who see things and do not want to report, mm -hmm. and they are, and they will, these persons will be protected um, under this new bill. Um, but we, of course, we have those persons who report with malicious intent, and that new bill does carry a fine for if mm -hmm. it is found that anybody reported something maliciously. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that is left for the courts to hear the evidence and to make the decision. And you mentioned that you could ensure the complete confidentiality, con confidentiality of the child throughout the entire process. Um, I don't know um, that I could say it's, I could. I could say it's full confidentiality. We, we recognize it's a small society. Um, we always say to people, you can call anonymously, you can give the information, um, and we will as much as possible protect once you say you do not want to be identified. We have persons who call and say, it's me, put my name down, and so they are happy to come into the court and to come to our offices to give reports. Um, but there's going to be um, something in the bill for persons who also do not want to identify themselves. Uh, my other question is, when a child is removed from their environment, is their, their education interrupted significantly? Um, certainly not. Even as we speak now, once a child is placed, whether as we spoke earlier in foster care or placed at the New Beginnings Transit Home, um, to some extent at the Boys Training Center, the education is continued. They do continue with schooling. Um, and of course, with the, the bills, this, this is going to continue as far as possible. The child's education will, will continue once it's under a situation of care and protection. And is, the, is this whole process, um, in the entire process, what happens with children with uh, developmental or physical disabilities? Yeah, well, it, it always poses a challenge in terms of getting placement. But um, when you look at the care and protection, pro it should not be any different for them. Um, as it stands now, I know sometimes within the court, and it's my colleagues I will tell you, issues of um, when we're dealing with children, if speech um, difficulties and the blind child, you, you know, mm -hmm. we are very limited currently in terms of persons, um, experts who can provide support, whether it is for Braille or sign language. Um, and so that is something we recognize as a society we have to work on, especially for those of us working with you know, vulnerable children in that way. But um, no, it, it shouldn't be any different in terms of how you're going to process a child, whether it's what child with special needs or a, a child. A child, a child. Mm -hmm, a child is mm -hmm. a child. Right. A child is a child at all times. <laughs> um, yeah, and so we just have to look at this child as, as a human being that we need to assist. Uh, there's something I want to go back to is what we, we earlier we were speaking about the adoption committee. Who is on the the adoption committee? The adoption committee really is um, a new a new dimension in our process, <coughs> mm -hmm. and the adoption committee really is going to be there to assist and to guide the division of human services. Division of human services is going to. Um, present all of the information and they sit as a committee to determine whether this is a feasible um, alternative for the placement of a child. So the adoption committee for us is something that is really new for us in the legislation and something that we are hoping is going to make a significant difference. Um, when we speak of adoption, the other thing too is that we are going to have some changes are going to have to be made. Once the bill is passed, as Mrs. Lewis indicated, the Division of Human Services is now going to be responsible for adoptions. It means that certain structures are going to have to put, be put in place in order to allow the division to, go, to carry out that mandate. So there are some things, some structures in all of the departments, as a matter of fact, that will have to be made in order for the proper um, use and fulfillment of these two pieces of legislation. And could, you, could you speak on the who exactly is on the, the committee? Who will be on the committee? The committee would comprise a pediatrician, mm -hmm. uh, an attorney, from mm -hmm. a representative from the Attorney General's office, um, the director of social services, a clinical psychologist, a mm -hmm. member of the, um, an NGO. 
Um, but that committee is really under the remit of the minister with responsibility for human service. So he is going to look at um, what is needed and to identify persons who would suit the criteria in the bill. Okay. Uh, we're coming closer to the end of the program, but what I want to talk about, uh, the bill makes reference of care application, care orders, and protection orders. Could you expand a little bit on, on those terms? Okay, these are the various orders that the court is going to grant with respect to an application that comes before it for a child. So depending on the information that is given to the court, um, the Division of Human Services brings in the application and requests a care order or a supervision order, and then the, the court, the magistrate, grants that order. So each of them is dependent on what specifically the child requ is required for the child, and the order would be granted based on what the child really needs. So each of them, there's a slight difference between each of them, and so the information and the evidence indicating whether which of these orders is necessary will be brought before the court in order for that to be made. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else that you ladies would like to add before we end the program? Um, just to say, I, I think, um, for, and I'm sure I could speak for Ms. Poyot and Mrs. Louis, that we are extremely pleased that St. Lucia is moving a step closer to legal reform um, to ensure greater protection and support for our children. Um, we all know that our current laws are archaic. They do not reflect what actually happens now in society. It is a process that we have been on from since 2001. Um, this model family legislation process. A lot of our um, partner con um, OECS countries have gone ahead and passed some, one or two. But St. Lucia has left, um, has been behind for some time now. And so we are certainly looking forward to this legislative change that is going to empower us as practitioners, empower families, ensure that there are proper guidelines and policies and protocols that are followed to ensure that our children and families get greater support. We, sometimes we, you know, we say we live in a very punitive society that we want punishment. It is not always about punishment, but is ensuring that there is development and growth for the better. And so it is, things are going to be different um, for all of us when those this bills are passed <coughs> and bet, um, different for the, the betterment of support to children and families in St. Lucia. Okay, well, I thank the three of you for joining me here on this panel discussion on child care protection under the adoption bill and the child justice bill. My name is Jacques Kingston Compton. Thank you for watching and stay tuned to more programming to the, in this station.